morning, church. My brother and I were sitting around the table last night after enjoying pizza, and uh, we were reminiscent about childhood. You know, you get to a certain age and you start thinking about childhood. And he goes, you know, he says, you know what I really enjoyed about going to church in Garibaldi, Oregon back in the day? And I says, "Uh, no, what? He says, I enjoyed the music and I really enjoyed the potlucks. He said, I really enjoyed the pot. He says, but he says, I have to tell you, there was something missing at our potluck last week. He says, there was no fried chicken. And Irene Creech didn't bring any salmon. You know, the things that we remember as child, children. You know, Irene, husband, loved to fish. And so we always, if there was a potluck, there was some salmon or steelhead or something of that type was going to be there. I remember some other things about going to church at Garibaldi. I remember where the wood room was and the frequent trips to the wood room. Not to put fire, wood into the fire, but to receive some of the kindling on my backside because of my behavior. And to get to the wood room, you had to walk to the door that was at the front left hand corner of the church and go down the stairs with your mom dragging you so everybody knew what was going to happen. You were going to go down and, uh, and have a semi-meeting of the minds. But I guess as, as, as I get older, uh, I begin to remember some of those things that, that happened when we, were, when we were kids. And many of our, our great memories are around things that happened at the church. We used to, we used to go with and meet the Warrington Church up at Short Sands Beach and have a, uh, a combined church picnic, uh, cookout, and try to play softball and some other things like that. I remember those, uh, those days and, and how much fun that was and how much we enjoyed uh, doing that. I never did understand why, though, it was so important, since we were all gathered with church people, why it was so important for us to get back to our separate buildings for Sunday night service. But... Everybody had to leave at a certain time so you could be back. As a child, I didn't understand that. And quite frankly, as an older person, I still wouldn't understand it. I want to, I want to continue our journey uh, through uh, this little epistle of 1 Peter. And I'm, I'm, only, I'm really going to take my time as I go through this because I think there are some really great lessons in there for us as individuals But great lessons within this passage of Scripture, this little epistle, for the church as a whole. Um, When Peter wrote this letter to the church, the church was going through massive changes because they were being persecuted by the government at that time. And they were being persecuted by, uh, by the people who did not agree with them. So they were going through massive changes kind of sounds like today doesn't it we're going through a lot of changes Uh, I mean a lot of people don't come to church anymore they they sit at home on the couch with their coffee in their pajamas and watch church on tv because a lot of people live stream if really quite frankly if you wanted to know what the message was about about 1 30 today you can catch it on youtube but it's, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as, as being with a group of people and fellowshipping with them and worshiping with them and going through it together, knowing that you've got other people who are there with you. And I don't think that the people, in the, the people even that used to come to church on a regular basis who, who are still watching at home fully grasp that. But take it away when you can't do it. Take it away when you can't do it. You can't do it because of your health. Or you can't do it because maybe the government says, or the people in power say that you can't do it, and you take it away, and then you begin to want it more. It's kind of like the person, it's like the person who goes on a diet. That's not me. But the person that goes on a diet... And you tell them, you cannot 
have bread. You can't have it. You can have everything else, but you can't have bread. What is the one thing that you will desire more than anything else? Bread. Because you can't have it. It doesn't fit in your diet. You know, that, that donut, which we're going to enjoy next week, Penny, that donut that we're going to enjoy, uh, you know, you can't have that. That six-layer chocolate cake, you can't have that. That homemade bread that just came out of the oven, can't have that. But, oh, you can have a salad. And so what's the last thing you want? The salad. We, we have been called by God to call other people to enjoy all of what God has given us. There is my sermon in a nutshell. We have been called by God to call other people to enjoy everything that God has given to us. If, if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to take them and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to just read verses 4 through 10. And some of these scriptures, that some of the words that are here come out of the book of Isaiah also. But he says to them, I'm just going to read verse 3 to kind, kind of lead into it. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined, destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The nation of Israel that Peter re refers to here, but the nation of Israel was called by God to show the entire world what a wonderful and awesome God he was. If you, if you know anything about history or much about history or want to take the time to learn a little bit about history, the nation of Israel was set up right on the main trade route for the world of that day. There was what they called the King's Highway that went right through it. That people would go that way to go up over into Far East Asia, India, that, and travel down into Egypt. And that was the trade route. And so all of the nations went right through Israel. Israel had a chance to be the missionaries to the whole world and never leave home. Because the world came to them. But they, they missed that. They missed what they were called by God to do. It was interesting. I was visiting with a, an individual last week, and they, they said that, and they were, we were talking about a, a class that I had taken, and they were talking about people at their school, and, and these were both Christian colleges that we were talking about, and in my case, the people were taking a class on the Restoration Movement, didn't even know what the Restoration Movement was, who had come out of Restoration Movement colleges. And he was saying that, yeah, I have people in my whole class that have no idea what the Great Commission is. That don't know what Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is. And we're both kind of, we're shaking our heads. 
The church has been called by God for a specific task. We have a task to do. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're supposed to make disciples. We're supposed to not only uh, be, be disciples ourselves, but we're, we're supposed to make disciples. And we, we have been called by God to do that. And we can never lose... We can never lose sight of that. Rhonda's uncle used to say something. He says, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. Church is not for us to come and sing a few songs, hear a message, and go home and go about life as if nothing changed. Church is about, and being called out by God, is to, for a specific task. And some of you may say, well, but I can't talk to other people. Oh, you talk to them. You talk to other people. You might not say anything, but you're talking to them. Because they're watching you. We had a lady, we had a lady that lived next door to us. I may have told you this already one time. We had a lady live next door to us in Bay City who was uh, an alcoholic. But people would come to our house on Sunday before 1 o'clock, and she said, they're not home. They won't be back until 1 o'clock unless they go to lunch with somebody else from the church because they're in church on Sunday morning. And so they would say, well, when can we catch them? Well, you got to be here before 6 because they're going to leave at 6 o'clock again to go to church. Oh, we were talking to her. See, we were talking to her, and we weren't telling her where we were going, but she knew where we were at. She knew every, day, every Sunday where we were at. She could tell them where we were going to be on Wednesday night too because we were going to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. So you see, we talk to people whether we think we do or not. Our actions often talk louder than our words. So God has called us, and he's called us not only to proclaim the goodness of him, but he's called us to be in a very special relationship with him. But let's look at verses 7 through 10 and talk about that for just a moment. Because we are the results of ignoring the call, the results of ignoring who Jesus Christ is. He says, so the honor is for you who believe that for, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You see, when we don't answer the call, there, there are consequences that come with that. As a child growing up, Raymond, come here. Raymond Ellis, I said, come here. I'm still okay. Raymond Ellis DeLoe, I told you to come here. I am not okay anymore. I'm in trouble. Because I was ignoring the call of my mother. She had a knack for doing that. She had a knack for just going, you know, Lloyd, come here. Lloyd Nolan, I told you to come here. Lloyd Nolan DeLoe, it's too late. We paid the price. And my brother would tell you that he never got to that point. I never want God to be saying to me, Raymond Ellis DeLoe, I said, come here. I really, I really want to be the really perfect about it, when it says, Raymond, come, I want to be on the way. I would love to tell you that that's how it happens all the time, but that's not how it happens all the time. So we, we, want, to, we want to be careful that we don't ignore God when he calls to us. And, we, and people may say, well, how do I know if God is calling me? You will know. You will know when the one who has called you, the one who is there for you, the one who has saved you. Jed, show me that picture. I, I want to I show you a, a picture. That's Paul. Remember Paul, the little boy that was in the swimming pool? 
that they didn't know for sure how long he was in there, that they, were, they thought he had died. Paul got to go home. And they're having a celebration at mom and dad's house. And this gentleman shows up whom Paul does not know. And he ran into his arms. That's the fireman. That's the one who saved that little boy. He had never met him. Nobody told him that's who it was. But instinctively, he knew who it was that saved his life. Brothers and sisters, instinctively we know when God is calling us. We know when he is calling us, and and we do not want to ignore the call because that ignoring of the call causes us to stumble and to fall and to come out of relationship with God. And we don't want to be there. We don't want to be there. Number three, the result of answering the call. I, I love this verse. I think it is a, uh, a, a, one of the most glorious verses in the Bible. Verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It don't get much better than that. It just does not. And then verse 10, once, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When we answer God's call, we are, we are flooded with so many things that sometimes we have a, a hard time grasping that. I had the privilege of being at... Uh, Missy and, and Luke's daughter's birthday party and watching her open gifts. And she was really just kind of over flooded with this. It was like, wow, there's, there's too much to take in. I can't grasp all of this at this time. Besides that, I'm only two. Come on, help me out here. You know, well, dad's helping a little bit and mom's helping a little bit and little brother wants to help even more. But, you know, we, that's the kind of the way it is with us in our Christianity. When, when we follow after Christ, the things that come our way, the things that we have, sometimes we just can't grasp it all. And we actually, it's nice if we have somebody that helps us to unwrap a little bit and tell us what's going on. God has a way of taking care of those who call him my my good friend Sam Risley with Hope 2, he's put out a, a, sent a, a, a little article on Facebook, and there's a, it's not a new van, but it's a new van to Hope 2 that they purchased over in Liberia just, just two days ago. Uh, Rich, his brother, was the negotiator, and I can tell you they got a good deal on it if Rich was the negotiator, because Rich is a horse salesman. I mean, he, he'll take your shoes off your horse and still make you a good offer. But Sam was saying, he says, I, the thing that keeps coming to my mind is manna. Manna. He says, it's, it's like we're the children of Israel and God just keeps giving us the manna that we need. He just keeps giving us all the things that we need to, to have this mission that we're, that we're on be successful. And he says, I, I'm already looking at all of the, the faces that will be in this van of teams and of people who will come and work here. God, manna, we don't run out. God just keeps taking care of us. It almost brings a smile to my face because I remember the old Chevy van that we had in Liberia that, with, a, with a Chevy trailer that was made from a Chevy pickup truck on the back of it and we had 46 people on the van and the trailer going down to the beach. You cannot overload a vehicle in Liberia. Just let you know that. It's impossible. Hopefully this van will not have that many people put on it. But when we answer God's call, he takes care of us. He sets us. We become special. We become 
precious to him. We are already precious to him, but we come, become more precious to him. And then he asked for us to be to proclaim the call, to tell him, to show him. And I love the, the passage, and I think it's in verse, I think it's in verse four, if I remember right. Yes, he says, verse five, you yourselves like living stones are built up as a spiritual house. You, you are each a, a part of the house. You are each like a, a living stone. And when, when you think about it, the children of Israel were, were famous in some ways for doing some things when they had a great moment in their life as a kingdom. They would, they would build things out of stones. When they went across the Jordan River, what did they do? They, they took 12 stones and they, they piled them up. And, and he said, now every time you go by here, every time you go by here, you're, when you're, you bring your grandkids by here, and they, they said, what is, what's this pile of stones? You said, oh, this is when God parted the waters and we walked across on dry land. Oh, wow. I wish I could have been there. Well, take my word for it. It was, it was, it was amazing. It, it was an amazing thing. He says here that we are living stones. You and I are living stones. And we, we are there for people to see what Christ is doing and has done in us. Our, our life itself is a testament to the great glory and riches of God. That is what our life is supposed to be. He says, so you are, you are a living stone. You are a monument to God. Sometimes this monument needs to be torn down so that it can be re-stood up and really be what it has been designed and destined to be. We live in a, a hurting, broken, dysfunctional world. We just do. We live in a world now, think about this, where for those of us that are a little older, we remember watching the ugly nightly news of the Vietnam War and of the soldiers on stretchers and the body bags and all. We remember all that. Do you realize that each year we lose more people to fentanyl deaths, overdoses, each year than all of the Vietnam War in one year? Do you realize that? Do you realize that we will lose more people to suicide than we will lose to auto deaths in America in this next year? Do you understand how badly the world needs Jesus Christ? And how badly we need to be good testimonies to what he is doing in our lives. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that you have to be in church every Sunday. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, that makes you such a good Christian. You went 52 weeks. We will give you a gold star for the year. You were in church every Sunday. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not as, imp I'm not as impressed by what you do on Sunday. I'm much more impressed by what are you doing on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday when you go to the basketball game. I would encourage as many of you that can go to the basketball game to go to the basketball game. But remember, we are a living testimony to God when that referee messes up that call i'm just i'm just because let me tell you 
Hey, what's the first thing the person sitting three rows over, two, three seats down and four people over from you who doesn't go to church, they're going to look around and say, oh, and they go to the Christian church. Just saying. I have been that person, not the one over there, the one that they're talking about. But I've also heard what people said about me when I was wearing the striped shirts and my wife was in the stands. From the church. So I'm saying we're, we're, we're called to proclaim the call and you're going to do more of that by the way you act than what you have to say. I want to encourage you to be, to be living stones. I want to encourage you to be a monument to what Christ has done for you and what he is doing for you. That's what, that's what Peter wants. Peter, who, who wrote this to the church at that time that was going through a lot of the things that we're going through today. He says, be, be God's people. Show God's love and mercy and grace to the people around you. Be a, be a monument to God. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you that you have allowed us uh, to be your people and to be your uh, testimony to you and to what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Pr I pray, God, that you would help us as we go through each and every day uh, to be... Uh, a monument to you, a monument that is, not, that is not flawed, a monument that is doing what you have called us to do, and I pray this in Christ's name, amen. In